SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. We're going to be talking about um, the proposed policies that were brought forward by the Alberta government um, regarding trans youth and parents' rights and um, kind of talking about the context of those. Um, and I will introduce myself, but I, I just want to start off with a land acknowledgement. And um, one of the things that I always do before I give my land acknowledgement is to say that land acknowledgements are just words. Um, they are important to do, and it's important to take accountability for the space we hold on, on uh, Blackfoot land, but it's also important to consider how we can act further than just giving land acknowledgements. What are the ways that we can incorporate uh, truth and reconciliation and calls to justice in our own lives? Um, but uh, that being said, we acknowledge that we live, work, and share space on the territory of the Nitsitapi, which consists of the Kainai, Bikani, and Siksika First Nations. We acknowledge the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit individuals who have served as stewards of this land and who continue to do so. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders, past and present, who have fought to keep their cultures and traditions alive despite ongoing attempts of assimilation. We recognize the work of decolonization as ongoing, and we as settlers have the responsibility to center indigenous voices and challenge systemic oppression of indigenous peoples. I won't spend a lot of time on myself, but that's a giant picture of my face. Um, my name is Katie Delicia Burke. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a queer and trans social worker. Um, I start all my presentations of this nature with that information, because I think it's important to situate myself, um, both in this discourse, but just as um, where I come from in the world, what my experiences are. Um, I am also a white settler. I am uh, from Connecticut originally and moved to Alberta in 2018. Um, and my work largely focuses on the meeting place between academics and community. Um, so I like to incorporate uh, trans feminist theory and research, but also what's going on in our community and the rich knowledge that comes from being a, a set of boots on the ground, so to speak, and try to use the strengths of both those communities to enrich one another. So today, we're going to um, first just kind of unpacking some myths that I think have arisen around this topic. I'm also just going to define some key terms so you all know what I'm talking about. Um, and then we're going to go through the different um, aspects of the policies, well, policy proposals, because they're not quite policies yet. Um, we really only have word of mouth at this point. Um, I may not get through all of the um, pieces because there is a lot to cover and I realized that as I was putting this together, but we're gonna do our best and then maybe if there's any gaps, we can get through those in question and answer. Um, so first, just unpacking myths. Uh, what are the misconceptions around this, these topics? Um, and just to give you some important definitions, you may already know some of these terms, but I'm gonna use them today so you should know what I mean. Um, so the word transgender is an umbrella term, and it incorporates, incorporates all individuals whose gender identity doesn't align with the gender they were assigned at birth. Um, cisgender is just kind of the opposite of that. That's individuals whose gender identity does align with the gender they were assigned at birth. Uh, they came out, doctor said it's a boy, and that was just who they were forever. And that was, yeah, and then that's fine. Uh, neither word are a slur or less than or greater than, they're just different experiences. Um, I'm gonna be using the phrase trans feminine today. Um, these are individuals who were assigned male at birth um, and are transitioning to be uh, to a more feminine gender expression and presentation. Um, the place that I come from is understanding that uh, it's, it's not so much that people were one thing and they're now another. Um, we are all born to be who we were and sometimes it just takes different amounts of time to figure that out. Uh, I didn't realize I wanted to be a social worker until I was in my late 20s, so we figure things out as we go through life. Um, and I'll also be using the word transmasculine, um, which are individuals who are assigned female at birth and are transitioning to be more masculine in their gender expression and presentation. Um, you may have heard the words trans men and trans women. Those are not incorrect terms, um, but there are folks who don't identify as men or women, uh, whether they be non-binary or genderqueer. Um, and trans feminine and trans masculine allows us to talk about folks and their transition um, without assuming a binary identity. So just to give you those terms. And if there's ever a term that I use and you're not sure, we can absolutely define that for you. So the first thing I wanna do is unpack the myth of normativity. We um, live in a society that makes a lot of assumptions that people fit into very neat categories that doesn't leave a lot of room for what the diversity that we actually live with. 
So one, uh, the first term is called heteronormativity. And these are assumptions that heterosexual identities are the normal or natural. Uh, and it often leads to the assumption that everyone you meet is going to be heterosexual. Um, a great example is you meet a man who you know to be married and you ask about their wife, even though they haven't identified that they have a wife. They may have a partner or a, um, a, a spouse who is a man. Um, another type of normativity is called cisnormativity, so cisgender being the root there. Um, and that's the assumption that cisgender identities are normal and that there is a natural gender binary in which, to all in which all people fit and that one's gender identity and pronouns can be assumed based on outward appearance. So an example is you see someone who's very masculine seeming, um, very masculine presenting, and you may use a he, him pronoun even though you don't necessarily know that that's how they identify. And these normativities can take shape um, in our own interpersonal interactions, but they're also very systemic. They are in our laws, in our policies. Um, thinking about when you go to uh, the registration to get a, a license or a new license, it's M or F. There's no room for any uh, diversity in there. So while they can be very personal, they're also very systemic. They're very much built into the fabric of how we um, categorize people and how we um, categorize information about people. And because of that nature, it can impact um, how welcome or included people feel. Another myth that I want to unpack um, is something called rapid onset gender dysphoria and the concept of trans identities as a social contagion. Um, this is a academic theory, and I use theory very lightly, um, that has been disproven, um, but it has taken root. Um, and influenced a lot of policy and a lot of ideology. Um, so the concept of transness or trans identity as a contagion um, is the concept that being trans or identifying outside of your assigned gender at birth um, can be spread, can be caught like an illness uh, through peer influence in a phenomenon called rapid onset gender dysphoria, which was theorized by um, Lisa Littman. Um, this theory was formulated to explain the rise, and I have quotes around the words rise for a reason, of the numbers of trans youth. Uh, and a comparable rise that we saw in our history was the rise of left-handedness. If you look at this graph, you'll see at a point that the number of people who self-report as being left-handed skyrocketed, and then it plateaus. The reason being is because we stopped slapping people on the wrist for being left-handed. We let people be left-handed, we made left-handed scissors. And then after that freedom was allowed, we kind of hit a steady level. And we had a steady, for the most part, number of people who were left-handed. The same can be said about the rise of trans identities, especially amongst youth. Um, I can speak from my experience growing up in the 90s. Information about gender identity, gender diversity was not available. I knew uh, that I was not necessarily the, the person that I was told I was, but it took me until my 20s to actually have the words to talk about it. Young people now, the, the Gen Z generation, has that information more readily available because they're growing up with the internet that I did not get till I was a late teen. Um, so they're able to identify their, how they uh, understand themselves much earlier. And that's not necessarily that there are more people identifying that way, it's just that they have information accessible much earlier. Um, but, so this theory was put forward and it was studied. However, um, after it was published, Brown University, uh, Littman's then employer, retracted it in a press release about the study um, uh, sorry, retracted it, and then a press release was put out by PLOS One, which was the peer-reviewed journal that posted it originally, and it redefined the study as descriptive and exploratory, and that it had not been clinically validated, so it couldn't be replicated. Um, and then the Journal of Pediatrics later published a comprehensive study that found no evidence of rapid onset gender dysphoria, uh, and over 60 psychological organizations have denounced the concept. Um, and in the article that I uh, cited for this, um, noted that in the study, 76.5% of parents surveyed believed their child was incorrect in their beliefs about being transgender. More than 85% said their child had increased their internet use uh, and or had trans friends before identifying as trans. Uh, and that the youth themselves 
had no say in the study, and that was the biggest issue. It was a study about trans youth that interviewed no, no youth. It didn't actually ask their perspectives, it only asked their parents. And Littman actually acknowledged in the study that reluctance to reveal one's identity to their parents may have contributed uh, to that number. And I would argue that it most likely definitely <laughs> contributed to that number. Um, coming out to one's parents, no matter how accepting they may be, can be very daunting. Uh, and for a young person who is learning about themselves from um, internet communities, from friends, it may seem that it suddenly comes up, but it's most likely something they've been thinking about for a long time. So this theory was discredited, but we see it pop up. And this, the uh, this theory and this understanding, as erroneous as it may be, is very much embedded in a lot of these policies. Um, and a great example of another uh, example of, of how um, theory, whether it's discredited or not, can run rampant is the um, theory that certain uh, vaccines cause autism. Andy Wakefield was largely discredited in his studies um, for a number of reasons. And those, uh, that theory that that specific vaccine leads to autism was completely disproven. However, a large number of people have stopped vaccinating their children. So even though a theory may be discredited, it can still carry immense social weight and, and embed itself into policy and an ideology. So with that in mind, and understanding how normativity can manifest, um, let's unpack some of these policy proposals. And the first one is about gender-affirming care. And now before uh, I get into it, I just want to uh, explain what transitioning is because I think there's a lot of misconceptions. Um, it's often framed as this monolithic understanding, but transition is in incredibly individual. What a, uh, a gender transition looks like to one person can be different for another based on just perception and where you are in your life, but it's also multifaceted. We have internal transition, which is just the mental process of exploring and identifying your own gender. And even cisgender people can um, go through this process of exploring and just coming to a better understanding of who they are. Doesn't necessarily mean anything is changing, but you have a richer understanding of yourself at the end. And then there's social transition. These are the outward elements of expressing yourself and your gender identity. And this can include going by a different name, um, using a different pronoun, um, using a different washroom, changing the clothing you wear, and doing things outwardly that make you feel more at home in your presence and existence and feeling affirmed in your gender identity. Um, they are, except for name changes, which are not permanent, just a pain to change back. None of these are permanent. You can grow your hair back out. You can uh, go back to wearing different clothes. But allowing for the freedom to, for young people to explore and, and see what works for them um, allows for just a richer understanding of self without um, you know, any concern of ir uh, irreversibility. And then we have medical transition, which is the crux of, of this particular part of the policy. And this is the element of transition for, for the best that I can frame it, is it seeks to bring the body into alignment with the mind. Um, understanding that certain physical traits align with certain gender identities, and that comfort and safety can rely on um, being more aligned, your body being in more alignment with that gender identity. There are medical procedures and, and medications that can be used to uh, undergo that process. However, it is important to note that these don't happen arbitrarily, they don't happen in back alleys. They are highly regulated. There are best practices that are identified by global organizations such as WPATH, which is um, world, uh, I have it outlined, I always forget the acronym, but they are a global organization that sets the standard for trans, youth, uh, trans uh, healthcare, both for youth and adults. Um, and these decisions are made in collaboration with medical professionals, often mental health professionals, and in the case of youth with families. Um, parents are, need to be on board and, and informed. And the concept of gender-affirming care is, is actually quite complex. Um, it is, of course, hormone replacement and gender-affirming surgeries, but that is a very small piece. We think about gender-affirming care, it's a whole host of supports um, and access to different, um, whether it's a community club or a social group, um, support groups, just being able to go to a doctor and have your needs met. Um, gender affirming care is a very large banner and the medical transition piece is actually quite a small element of it. So what are the policy goals? Um, to end in the words of Daniel Smith, to prevent youth from making irreversible choices, um, the goal of the, um, policy is to ban puberty blockers and hormone therapies, which I will define, uh, before the age of 16, and to ban gender-affirming surgeries for those 17 and under. 
So I want to talk about puberty blockers and hormone therapy first. So just to inform you, puberty blockers, um, they are full name, uh, uh, we're going to try to pronounce this, gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs. What they do is they suppress the release of sex hormones, so testosterone or estrogen, during puberty. And they were originally invented for youth who um, experience something called precocious puberty. It's when their body begins to go through puberty before they are physically ready to do so. And this can happen for a number of different reasons. Um, but ultimately, it wasn't designed uh, ex experimentally for trans youth. It was for youth who needed to pause puberty because their body was trying to force it too early. And um, so puberty blockers are typically um, t started currently at the start of natal puberty, so the natural puberty that a body wants to go through, um, and usually take until about 16 or 18 when um, the young person is considered to be old enough to make decisions um, with consent of parents if under 18. Um, for, uh, for adults, of course, 16, 18 isn't really an adult, but for the sake of the discussion, um, there is the option of hormone replacement therapy, um, which is ultimately to, for the development of secondary sex characteristics, so um, whether it be breasts or lack thereof, hips or lack thereof, you get the point, um, for individuals who, uh, whose natal puberty does not align with their gender identity. Um, and this can be in the form of testosterone for trans masculine folks, um, or for trans feminine folks, antiandrogen, which is a testosterone canceller, uh, as well as estrogen supplements. Now, as I mentioned, puberty blockers specifically were developed for youth with precocious puberty. Um, GNRHA, which is puberty blockers, has been used in the treatment of gender dysphoria since the mid-1990s. We've been using these medications for quite some time, and their efficacy in delaying puberty in adolescents is documented by numerous studies and scientific publications. Uh, Giordano and Holm, the article that I quoted, had about 12 listed, and I would imagine there's probably more. Um, I would assume they only listed 12 for the sake of brevity. The key is delaying. We know from all of the work that's been done since the 1990s that, uh, and the fact that it's used for folks with precocious puberty, that these press pause. They delay puberty so that young people can make decisions about themselves without having to go through um, a natal puberty that may cause them more distress and more effort on the other side when they turn 18 and are able to consent for themselves. So, uh, and, and kind of speaking to the note of, of from our premier about making irreversible decisions, the definition of puberty blockers is that they are very reversible. Once they are stopped, once the individual stops taking them, their natal puberty kicks in and they go through it just as they would normally, just delayed. And uh, there we go. So WPATH is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, as well as the Canadian Pedi Pediatric Society, among many others, support the need for gender-affirming care for youth, both social and medical, uh, have developed and utilized best practice for care that are, is in line with current research and practice. This is not arbitrary or random or invented. It's informed like any other medical care. Um, and they state that puberty blockers, should uh, their use should start with the onset of puberty, not before. So um, between ages of nine to 13, depending on the individual. Now, hormone replacement therapy is not as uh, irreversible, or rather is not as reversible. There are some things that are, there are some things that aren't. Certain things develop that can't be reversed, some things can be. Um, and decisions around hormone therapy currently are decisions made by professionals and families based on the individual mental, emotional, and physical development. And that's kind of at the crux of the issue with the ban. Um, one, the, the ban uh, essentially renders puberty blockers useless uh, because they're not able to be used until 16 when puberty is well underway. And the idea of a puberty blocker is to make that transition easier. That if the young person does decide that this is their identity and they want to go forward with hormone replacement, they're not fighting against their body, their body is working with them. Um, and also, setting blanket laws like this does not take into account that each of our bodies is unique. We all have our own biology, uh, and some people mature faster than others, some people less, both mentally and physically. So the current system allows for these factors to be taken into account through um, you know, medical procedures and, and doctor analysis and you know doctoral analysis and using best practice and medical data, um, but also taking into account each individual, what their needs are, where they're at. When we set a blanket ban like this, we, we rule that out. And we also take away the right of parents to consent, to say, yes, this is what is best for my child because I 
have communicated with my child and I understand that this is what's right. So, moving on to gender-affirming surgeries. I just want to quickly define them. So top surgery um, is basically anything above the waist. Typically when we use usual words top surgery, we're talking about either mastectomy, so the removal of a breast, or breast augmentation. Bottom surgeries, it's kind of a longer list. And that has anything to do with genitalia, essentially. Uh, what kind of surgery can uh, depend on the body and the desired outcome. But just so that you know, when I say top, it means above the waist and bottom is below the waist. Now. The current laws in Alberta, and this is not the policy proposals, this is where we're at at this very moment. Coverage for bottom surgeries is restricted to 18 plus. Uh, so we don't actually need a law to say that because we're already doing that. Um, and eligibility for top surgeries is limited to 16 plus. Um, the reason that that is lower is because development levels, some folks develop much faster than others, um, and especially thinking of someone who's very maybe top heavy, uh, and that is a source of gender dysphoria, being able to access that earlier um, because it is you know, not a life-threatening surgery by any means um, can be more in line with what we know about gender-affirming care. But the idea that you know, these policies are needed and the tone in which they were presented um, feeds into this notion that these surgeries are occurring on very young people, 13 or, or younger. And that's just not the case. Th those aren't happening at that age, and especially not here in Alberta. Um, the surgeries in the younger age brackets are very rare, and they're in with a great amount of consultation. Uh, you, you don't just arbitrarily perform surgery on someone without knowing that it's safe to do so and that it's necessary. So it is a lot of fear mongering. It's this idea that surgeries are happening on young people when they are categorically not. And um, to quote actually my doctor, <laughs> who was interviewed by CBC, Dr. Jake, John Jake Donaldson, there may be very few people whose gender identities have been stable for, very long, for a very long time, have supportive families, good support network, are in therapy uh, that are able to get in under the age of 18. That's speaking to any type of gender affirming care. So it is very rare for folks under 18 to even have access to the care. So the, the fear that this is happening is, is a bit misfounded just in the data. And also in this conversation, we overlook the existence of intersex individuals. Folks who are intersex um, are basically anyone who is, whose body, whether it's their hormones, um, their uh, DNA, uh, their chromosomes, uh, their genitalia, secondary sex characteristics are not perfectly aligned with either the typical male or the typical female. Um, and that can be for a lot of different reasons in a lot of different ways. Um, but intersex folks, often, uh, from a young age, require uh, some form of what we would label gender-affirming care for a trans person just to have a healthy body or have a body that's in line with their identity. So this doesn't take into account that there are, other than just gender dysphoria reasons, medical reasons why individuals might need access to gender-affirming surgeries or gender-affirming medication. It also doesn't take into account that many intersex folks who are identified at a young age are forced to undergo coercive surgeries. They're called corrective surgeries. The idea that if they don't, uh, they're especially for genitalia, if they don't match a specific idea of what it's supposed to look like, that from a very young age they can be forced to undergo surgery that a parent consents to, but they are much too young to even be aware that it's happening. So we don't talk about that coercion and how young people aren't even given a choice in that, but we do talk about the gender affirming part where young people are actually making choices. So kind of just putting that out there. So, the other key piece is the social transition representation. Okay. So we're talking about um, what does it, uh, the, the pronoun bans and, and things like that. Um, so policy goals. Uh, require parental notification and consent um, for youth under the age of 15, um, 15 and under who wish to go by a different name pronoun in school. Um, and then for 16 to 17, it would require notification but no consent. And it would also require parents to opt in if a teacher plans to teach about gender identity or sexual orientation or sexuality. So quickly, I just want to address the concept of parents' rights. Uh, parental rights are not a concrete set of rights outlined in the Charter or any similar legislation in the US or Canada. Um, if we look at the Saskatchewan policy around pronouns uh, and consent required for pronouns in schools, um, the child advocate in Saskatchewan produce a 40-page report about how that policy violated and how the concept of parental rights actually violate the charter rights of young people. Specifically, they discriminate that policy and policies like it, discriminate based on gender identity and expression, um, and they assert that all peoples have the right to have their identities and expression respected. 
and thinking about why might a child not share their identity with their parents? What are the factors at home that we can't account for or aren't aware of that would lead a child to not feel safe or comfortable sharing that information with their parents, but might want to seek an affirming space at school where they are safer? And this is not about hiding information from parents. It's never about that. It's about allowing young people to have agency over their identities and being able to assert who they are, um, while acknowledging that sometimes experimentation doesn't always lead to a new identity, but it just leads to a richer understanding of the self and it still has immense value. Um, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on the statistics, but the statistics are there. Um, I pulled this from a Trans Pulse Canada study, um, they, uh, specifically on health and well-being among trans and non-binary binary youth from 2021. I'm just going to pull it all up. So um, in the past year, suicide ideation and suicide attempts amongst trans youth, two in five had considered, one in ten had attempted. That is a terrifying number. Um, in the past years, 72% of youth were verbally harassed, one in five had avoided school because of harassment, and 70 had avoided public restrooms. So um, this is speaking to a group, uh, to a sect of young people who do not feel welcome in public life and are actively being discriminated against or experiencing violence. But that's not limited to just school or public life. Um, one in four youth had family members who stopped speaking to them or ended their relationship due to their identity. One in five um, had family members who would not let them express their gender identity through the right clothing. Um, one in 10 were sent to a therapist or counselor to try to prevent them from being trans. Um, family support consistently um, is a major topic when we talk about young people, their mental health, and their long-term livelihood. 58% um, were told by their parents, uh, or, or sorry, 58% of youth were told by their parents or guardians that they were respected or supported, so only half of the youth who were um, surveyed, and this is in Ontario. Um, and 50, only 50% 50 were called by their correct name and pronouns. So keeping in mind those statistics uh, of, there's a very frightening number of young people who are not being affirmed and welcomed and respected in their homes, the ability to go to school, which is where they spend a great deal of their time, and be addressed by the correct name, the correct pronouns, is immensely important. And I um, want to talk about representation in the classroom, but I'm also aware that I'm running out of time. So I do just want to point out that our teaching standards for Alberta educators um, promote, that their goals are to promote and sustain inclusive learning environments where diversity is embraced. Uh, and if you need parental consent to just use a different pronoun, are they able to do their jobs as they're outlined in their teaching standards? Um, there is also a, a piece in the Provincial uh, Resource Review Guide, which is the me metric by which any kind of content brought into the classroom is analyzed and, and approved or disapproved. And um, when it comes to content around um, sexuality specifically, the, the ruling is uh, exercises including subject matter dealing primarily and explicitly with the religion or human sexuality requires parent notification. I have spoke to many educators as someone who does a lot of professional development. And despite how very clear that this is, that they're speaking about essentially sex ed um, and very specific conversations around what sexuality or gender may be, a lot of schools in our province use this language to create barriers so that educators can't introduce any type of representation. Even just a storybook with a queer family in it is often met with this expectation that we have to inform parents. So it creates administrative barriers to just basic representation and inclusion. So, in terms of well-being and belonging in the classroom, uh, the proposed policies stand to, they add administrative load to teachers. They use something called administrative violence, which makes it harder for teachers and harder for youth to have content in the classroom that represents them. Um, and it also uh, makes it so that they can't um, just be addressed the way they want to be. Um, it places students in vulnerable positions and potentially violent situations, undermines the agency of youth, um, positions parents as the owners of youth rather than their guardians and, response, and having responsibilities to them, um, and just others trans youth in the classroom and denies them vital and affirming spaces, um, and enforces the strict gender binary. Uh, so I'm going to skip over the sports ban because that is a loaded topic, and I want to just get to the other considerations before I have to wrap up. So these are just the other elements that I didn't necessarily fit into anywhere else, but I think they're important to keep in mind. So one, in terms of these policies, there is a complete lack of consultation. Uh, with teachers, the ATA made a very firm statement that they were not consulted. With youth and families, again, many youth and family groups have said the same. 
with queer organizers and researchers, uh, with medical professionals. There is a long list of medical professionals who have come out in opposition to these policies. Um, they employ dog whistles, the idea that we need to protect children, which is reliant on the idea that queer and trans identities are harmful and that queer people are groomers uh, or pedophiles that seem to seek to indoctrinate young people rather than allowing young people to be themselves and wildly and liberally be who they are, whatever that may be. And uh, the idea of gender ideology, which uh, trivializes trans identities and makes it um, a political statement rather than just a state of being. Um, the use of fear rhetoric, frame, uh, framing affirming non-cisgender identities is inherently harmful rather than liberating. Uh, emphasis on the notion that trans youth are confused and need to be protected from making mistakes. Uh, banning surgeries that are not happening to begin with. Um, and if enacted, these would be the most severe anti-trans laws in Canada to date. They mirror similar bills in conservative states in the US, of which 400 plus have been introduced this year alone. And that is, a, I believe, the number was 600% increase from last year. And it engages in an ongoing culture war in which trans people and trans youth are a focus. And I lastly just want to throw up, this is a list of organizations that support gender-affirming care for youth, both medical and social. It's a very long list, and these are not niche organizations, the APA being one of them, the American Psychological Association. And I'm gonna wrap up with the end game. What is the end game of policies of this nature? And largely it is the legal removal of trans identities as legible identities in our social circles and our legislation. Um, an example of this is that a Republican legislator rather Republican legislators were recorded in a virtual forum planning to try to ban trans health care for all trans people, all ages. This is a direct quote from that meeting. In terms of endgame, why are we allowing these practices for anyone? Why would we stop for under 18, but not apply this for anyone over 18? It's harmful across the board, and I think that's something we need to take into consideration in terms of the endgame. That statement is categorically false. It flies in the face of everything we know in terms of research and community understanding, but it speaks to what these policies seek to do. It seeks to remove trans identities from our spaces and make trans people, or make it so that trans people can't exist in public life. For those who are wanting to ask questions, you know the drill, please line up. I will push my chair out of the way. Please line up. Just right here where Stephanie is. Um, when you are coming up to the mic, please speak directly into the mic and state your first and last name. Um, no long preludes, no stories, please. We expect respectful and polite discourse. If you prefer to write your question, um, just let it to me and I will get it to Katie. And just thank you very much um, for being here and thank you so much, Katie, for sharing your expertise. It was really great. We got a new mic stand. Look at this going up and down. Hi, I'm Henning Lundell. Am I speaking to the mic? Are you getting me? I have two uh, questions. One very quick, and the other one maybe you can elaborate. The very quick one. So basically, what Danielle Smith proposed is a red herring, because basically you're dealing with adults, 18 plus. Okay, the one and number two. Can you please? explain no, uh, what is the range of people that consider themselves queer? Yeah, absolutely. I can absolutely answer that. So um, the first question being, uh, when it comes to, uh, the, 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 the age range can be very variable. That's okay, I got it. <laughs> uh, but in terms of surgeries, obviously we're talking about usually 18 plus, anything under, and it's very, very rare, and like I said, with tons of consultation and consideration for individuality. Um, hormone blockers being the only thing that we're really talking about at a younger age because we're talking about blocking puberty and puberty starts quite young, but like we said, like I said earlier, it's, it's delaying. Now, in terms of the word queer, because that is a great question and I, and I maybe should have defined it. Um, queer is, it used to be a slur and there may be people in this room who heard it as a slur in their time. Um, it has since, I believe, the 1980s undergone a reclamation effort um, because it is a term that allows us to 
be all-encompassing. Um, often when we use the acronym, you may have seen there's a plus at the end, and the plus speaks to identities that we haven't listed, so it always leaves people out. Um, so personally, I, I try to use queer when I can, um, personally for myself, because I identify as a queer person um, in terms of my uh, sexual orientation. It just makes it easier than explaining a very complicated concept to people I don't know. Um, but in terms of it as an all-encompassing concept, I use queer to talk about anyone who would fall under the TUS LGBTQ plus community. So that's folks whose sexuality is not heterosexual and or people whose gender identity is not cisgender. Is that awesome? You're welcome. Come on up. Welcome. Um, Barb McNeely Shears. Um, I, Barb McNeely Shears is my name. Um, I was listening to the news last week, and there was a direct rave from Red Deer Catholic Regional School, and I was pretty horrified by that. It wasn't. It t takes Daniel. That's not even her original first name, <laughs> sorry, she changed, you know, whatever. And they expanded on it, and I, I mean, like they, I'm sorry to rattle my page there. Um, like they removing, I, I can't remember if she said that, but like removing the pride stickers mm -hmm. and the safe space stickers, mm -hmm. like I can't even imagine what, how horrible, like why would you take that off your door? Like the teachers have to take that stuff, and they're not supposed to, if they report to administrators any instance of a st student disclosing their sexual orientation or gender identity, and this president of the ATA said his understanding was even if they, the teachers overheard a, a te overheard a conversation or anything in the hall, they were supposed to d report that to the superintendent and to the families. Like, you know, and they couldn't use pe kids' nicknames or their their middle name. Like, it's just screaming like they've expanded it like she opened the door and so how do you stop that I mean this is just a horror show mm -hmm. and how do you stop that and how do you stop that like legally what do you you do hey great question um, and I and I do want to just very quickly address something that you mentioned about how Danielle is not her first name it's, it's funny um, but I also um, because I've seen a lot of different people talking about it. And personally, I will call her Danielle. Um, the reason being because I, I don't like fighting fire with fire. Um, you know, we respect the names that people want to go by. Um, it's the same reason that I don't agree with Caitlyn Jenner on anything, but I will refer to her as Caitlyn and use she, her pronouns, because invalidating people's identities is not helpful and it doesn't set a good example. Not that I think that anyone uh, did, but I just wanted to address that, because that's something that I've talked about a lot recently. Um, but that was a great question. How do we stop? How, how do we oppose um, things that we know aren't, aren't right, um, especially in terms of these policies? Um, I was also very concerned to see that the Catholic school district in, in Red Deer, um, and, and uh, I don't know how far reaching that uh, particular policy was, was even more draconian than what it was proposed. Um, the removal of safe space, safe space stickers especially is concerning because uh, a safe space is what a classroom should be for everyone. Um, in opposition, I think, uh, letting your voices be heard, but also amplifying the voices of people who have lived experience. Um, my, my motto is never speak for, uh, speak up. Uh, amplify what's already being said. So um, I'm not the only one who's saying things. There's um, some amazing scholars and amazing community workers. Um, Faye Johnstone and uh, Florence Ashley are two folks who come to mind as well, as well as many others, uh, and, and youth especially, who are stepping up and speaking their piece about this, who are being very vocal. So getting, in, getting a sense of what they're saying and amplifying that, sharing it, um, you know, contacting your MP, or not MP, sorry, I'm, a, I'm American, so it's MLA, I believe? MLA, I'm learning. <laughs> contacting your MLA, um, contacting uh, our provincial government, contacting anyone who is, um, has a work that's adjacent to this, whether it's the education minister, um, anything like that, and, and letting them know that Alberta isn't a place where misinformation should be guiding policy. We should be guiding policy with data, with, with uh, the voices of, of young people and people who have that lived experience, um, and listening to professionals. Um, I think we uh, experienced a, a period in COVID where uh, people really lost faith in, in medical professionals for a variety of different reasons, and um, 
I'm not going to get into that topic, but I think we've, we've learned in some ways that we can discredit research because it's just as uh, prone to ideology as anything else. But um, when we start losing touch of science, we start losing touch of that understanding, then we take a really big step back as a culture because uh, research and, and, and scientific understandings are the cutting edge of, of our understandings of the world. So I think really emphasizing that these policies are not in line with what we know with what we've uh, seen to be true and what the experiences that young people especially are bringing forward, it's not in alignment with what they're saying. And if there is such a misalignment, are these policies really in the best interest of Albertans or just specific Albertans? Yeah. Come on up. Hello, I'm Mary Shellington. Um, I'm a retired uh, social worker. Uh, I don't know if I've said that before, but we had an interesting family supper last night in which um, our granddaughter and her husband were present, and the, the discussion, from my perspective, became about fear. Uh, our granddaughter was concerned about her seven-year-old daughter, uh, who, uh, when she went to a washroom, which was not necessarily marked only for females, but even if it was, there could be uh, a trans come into there, into that washroom. And she didn't like that, uh, particularly for her daughter. There's a five-year-old gra a grandson as well, our son, uh, and she, she didn't mention anything about him, but the daughter she mentioned. And so how do we, how, what would you, rec we responded to it, uh, of course, uh, being being uh, trans accepting and um, uh, went with that, but how uh, that fear is there, and I'm sure she's not the only mother that's fearful. So, how what would you recommend we deal with that? I, I've got some things to say for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, I think a big theme of what I'm bringing to you today is is looking at data, um, looking at what we know, um, and statistically the number of instances where a person who either who factually identified as uh, a feminine presenting person or a woman or pretended to, which I've yet to actually hear about, um, and then walked into a public restroom and committed an act of violence against someone in that space, I have never heard of an instance. There, uh, and if, if there have been, I am going to assume that it's very limited because none of the research that I've looked into has stated that it is even statistically um, relevant or, or notable. Um, the fear that comes from this, because we often only talk about trans women and trans feminine people going into women's bathrooms, it's largely rooted in this idea that of the gender binary and that what you were assigned at birth is forever who you are and what you are. Um, so it's also rooted in the idea that we need to protect women from men. Um, I don't know if you've ever accidentally walked into the wrong bathroom by accident, but no alarms go off. Um, you can walk in and, and go through your whole process and not even realize that you're in the wrong bathroom. I've done it uh, twice in my life. Bad, bad signage. Um, no alarm goes off, so you don't need to be in a dress and makeup to walk into a women's room and commit an act of violence. You can just walk in. So no one is going through the effort of transitioning and going through the social and, and medical and all the pressures to be who they are just to commit acts of violence in a public restroom. Every trans person I've ever met is just there to relieve themselves quietly and discreetly and then get on with their day. That's it. The fear mongering is a lot to do with that end game, the, the removal of trans folks from public spaces because if you can't use a public washroom safely, can you go anywhere? I know a lot of folks who avoid using the washroom. I know especially uh, transmasculine folks who constantly get UTIs and other infections because they are not feeling safe in using a washroom. It's a big issue. So my challenges to it are, what is, how, have you heard of any information of, of this happening? What is the statistics? What, what is the real threat here? Is it a perceived threat or is it an actual threat? Um, what are, what's the data? That's always my first one. But also, why aren't we worried about um, transmasculine folks going into men's rooms. Why aren't we concerned about that? Their, you know, uh, their safety, if we're thinking that all men are predators, uh, what about the safety of those folks? So I think it's a very hypocritical position, um, but not to say that everyone who believes it is a hypocrite, because I think there's a lot of fear, and, and we play on fear, because psychologically, fear is much more tangible than anything else. We uh, tend to retain memories of negative experiences because they inform our actions later, whereas the good experiences sometimes don't always stick around so much. 
So I would say really just asking what is the understanding? How do you, uh, what makes you feel that that is a risk? Um, have you ever felt threatened by someone who walked into a washroom? Um, whose identity did not match their own. Um, I would say that statistically we know that most domestic violence and sexual violence happens within families, with, with people that you know, um, not strangers. So looking at the data and really understanding what the threats are and um, not um, giving into fear rhetoric that isn't data-driven. Hi everyone, I'm Christy Thomas. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was it was very moving for me. I was thinking of my two small children and hoping that they have the safety uh, to express who they want to be uh, as they grow up. My question is related to along the lines of the education piece when it comes to to parenting. I mean, I don't I don't want to say that I'm like a progressive parent, but I'm liking to like I I have the idea that you know there's safety safety in my home, safety in the schools. How do you is there like a specific education piece around? teaching parents that a safe space at school like this is, is best for all? That is a good question. Hmm. I think it starts with addressing the the seeming fear of diversity. We, we are afraid of being exposed to diverse experiences. And I don't necessarily know if I know where that comes from. Um, but I think it's, one, just important to think about how much time a student spends at school of, of their life from, from the ages of about five to 18. It's uh, arguably, I would say, they probably spend more time there than at home. So having that space, being safe, and, and not just safe from you know, uh, a, a school shooter, God forbid, or, or something like that, but psychologically safe. Being able to walk through that door and know that not only will your body be safe, but your emotional well-being and your mental health will also be safe. And you'll also f see yourself represented. Um, it is difficult for a young person to dream and to have a hope of who they're going to be if they can't see someone like themselves doing the things they're interested in. If a young uh, queer or trans person who wants to be a musician, how can they have hope for their future if they aren't exposed and able to see trans and queer musicians or artists or, or scholars or any of those things, just in the same way that every young person looks for role models. Um, it's difficult to find a role model when everyone who's in front of you, uh, everyone who's brought into your classroom or in your storybooks doesn't look like you, doesn't have a life like you. Um, so even just giving our young people hope and, and a dream for who they can be and an understanding of who they are, um, we need a safe space for that to happen. Uh, you can't you know, dream of a future if you're worried about your present. So I think there's uh, an incredible and important value in safe spaces, um, both physically and psychologically. Um, and I think parents need to understand that their children being exposed to different ways of thinking doesn't harm them. It makes them better citizens of a very global world. Um, you know, the gender binary, as we understand it, is not universal. It is Western, it is European, and, and, and a little bit North America. There are cultures around the world that have third, fourth, and fifth genders, and these aren't new. They have been part of their cultures since time immemorial. So by understanding that there are diverse ways to understand the world and understand yourself, you are able to interact with a diverse world much better. You're going to be a better citizen, a more informed citizen, and a more compassionate, empathetic person. And I can't think of a negative of being a compassionate and empathetic person. I, I just don't see the argument there. So I think really emphasizing the importance of, of psychological safety and, and welcoming in the classroom, um, and that every student benefits from that, whether it's directly to who they are, or just being in proximity to a more empathetic and compassionate world. So, yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. My name is Dave Major, and uh, as a retired biologist, I'm wondering, uh, most of the discussion seems to be based on psychology and sociology, but I'm wondering how much actual biology is being done to determine why the 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 sex at, at birth kind of doesn't produce the results that we thought it would, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and I guess the second point would be: Are there studies that are that might have the potential for saying, well, yes, the reason this person feels this way is because of this biology or? Mm -hmm blood chemistry or whatever. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. Um, 
So the first one, I think, the, in a biological sense, something that we think we take for granted is that um, there are two categories into which bodies fit, male and female. And we actually, in a biological level, know that that's not true. Um, in terms of a composite average, your body does fit into a category of male and female for most folks. But if we actually look at each individual piece of your body, the density of your bone, the size of your brain, um, you know, all of those factors, the, the hormone levels, the, um, how much iron is in your blood, how much calcium is in your system, it is so variable. And we know this because there, you're never gonna have the same treatment as your friend when you go to the doctor for the same issue. It may be different. You might have a different milligram of the same medication. You may have a whole different medication altogether because you have a different allergy. The thing is, is that we have immensely complex bodies. And intersex people, like, like I mentioned, folks who don't, or very evidently don't fit neatly into those categories are a ex more extreme example. But we all have an incredible amount of diversity in our own bodies. Um, so I think we kind of fall into this, it's, it's an easy dichotomy to have if you're either female or male because our brains like to categorize things. It makes life easier. We have neat boxes that we can put people into and we don't have to think too hard, <laughs> which is helpful sometimes. But I think we've, as we've begun to study the body more and more, we're understanding that there's an immense amount of diversity in our own bodies from one person to another. So when we take into that account that there is no clear male and clear female, just kind of averages that help us make sense of things, um, understanding that uh, there's also a great deal of gender <laughs> variance kind of makes sense. But it's also, I think, good to separate the two. I think, um, you know, I have uh, the brain of someone who has good knees. Tell my body that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would love to be someone who runs and hikes. I don't. Uh, I can't. Uh, I can, well, I can hike, but I can't run. The idea is that I think um, biology plays an important role in our understanding of bodies, but our brains are also uh, separate in a lot of ways. Um, and in terms of studies that may be looking into a biological cause, I'm not aware of any. Um, I am sure that there are some. But I think there's also a concern about that type of study. And it's the same one where folks have looked for the gay gene. And the idea being that, yes, it would be really cool from like a scientific curiosity level to just understand what determines gender. How is gender linked to the body? I would love to know because I just like to understand the world that I live in. However, if we look at, you know, there are places that allow individuals to find out if their baby has Down syndrome early and potentially abort that baby. Um, you know, when we find out uh, how to identify on a biological level things that are socially labeled as imperfections, um, we run the risk of greater discrimination. So while it would be really great to understand it, and I, and I think that someday we will, I think we also need to approach that topic with a level of caution and, and really understand what is going to be done with this information. Is it going to be done to enrich our understanding and, and validate identities, or is it just going to be weaponized to um, erase people that don't fit into norms because now we understand how to prevent it? Um, I, I will quote Jeremy Go uh, come on. Jurassic Park. Jeremy Goldblum, is that his name? <laughs> Jeremy Goldblum, life finds a way. So I think even if we did identify the cause and tried to eradicate it, human beings are so diverse, we'll still find a way to be queer no, no matter what. So, but biology is fascinating and I would love to see where we go in understanding of why, how biology and queerness relate to one another. I, I hope that answers your question. For one more. Sorry, I'm, I'm uh, okay, quick, 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 quick. Hi, I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, i just make a comment about Dave. Identical twins are never identical. Mm. So anyway, I actually have two questions. One, what's the, the hormone treatment costs are not very high, but what's the cost of four or five years of gonotropin blockers? My second sort of one is we all look at these trans athletes in the States, and you can obviously see in a women's sport where somebody is way beyond the rest of the crew. And I think that's what really sets off a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can do both and I'll do them very quickly so we can still get to our last question. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, can, what was the first one again? Cost. Unfortunately, puberty blockers are way more expensive. <laughs> um, and I think partly that is because uh, we haven't actually taken a look at making them affordable. Uh, 
you know, the cost of insulin is a great example. It doesn't need to cost that much. It does because profiteering in the pharmaceutical sector. Unfortunately, puberty blockers are quite expensive. Um, they do fall to, uh, you know, personal health care plans rather than the government uh, coverage, as with all medications. Like, personally, I'm on HRT, and that is something I pay for out of pocket or if I did not have insurance. Um, so it is a bit more expensive, and I think partly just because we need to actually look at uh, profiteering and capitalism in the pharmaceutical sector, but that's a whole other talk that I can give. Um, and the second question, and I'm glad you brought it up because it was the one topic I didn't get to talk about, um, and that's the concept of, of sports. And I think it's a very complex topic, and I think it gets to the root that actually separating people based on gender or sex for sports just doesn't make sense to begin with. Um, but I'll give you a great example. Um, there was an Olympic, uh, Olympian athlete from South Africa named Castor Semenya. They are a cisgender woman assigned female at birth. They had all of their Olympic medals stripped from them because they had an abnormal natural testosterone level. Um, they weren't trans, they had never undertaken any kind of medication or surgery, but they were not allowed to compete and actually lost their accolades because of something their body naturally did. So if we look at that, and then we also think about, um, you know, trans women in sports specifically, a lot of sports, whether or not I agree with it, a lot of these sports agencies have a requirement for hormone replacement therapy. And I will let you know, I've lost a lot of strength <laughs> since I started hormone replacement. I've been on it for about uh, almost 10 years now. Um, I actually shrunk an inch and a half, funny enough, because of uh, musculature. Um, so it, it has a very significant impact. And while I think there's a lot more conversation that needs to happen about is that should that be a requirement for certain things? Um, I, I, I think that it's a, it needs to be looked at more holistically than just banning. I think we need to actually take a step back and look at how do we separate people from sports? Because I can speak to just being in high school. I knew guys that I could bowl over and I knew women who could take me out and I'm not a small person. <laughs> so I think looking at things on a gender perspective and the idea that women are weak, men are strong, it's inherently misogynist and we need to actually take a step back and look at how do we adjudicate sports. And another example of you know, where these bans might come from, the uh, Interna I think it's the International Chess League banned trans women from competing. I know, I'm going fast. So just thinking about why would we ban people from a chess league if it's just about body and physicality? So uh, sorry, please come up and say your questions so I can get you You're out. doing I, great, you're doing great. I get uh, winded, long winded. So. You're doing fantastic. My name is Knut Peterson. My question is quick. Uh, I hear that equality and, and diversity program at the universities are now also under threat uh, of being discontinued or cut. Could you comment on that? I know you have a little bit of an idea about that. Um, so, I mean, I think the idea of, of, of removing EDI from post-secondary specifically, it stems from this fear of, of wokeness. Uh, now, I'm just going to put this to bed. Wokeness isn't a thing. It's a made-up term. Uh, it's based on an African-American vernacular term for being aware of one's world, for being aware of structural violence and systemic oppression. Um, but it's been converted into this notion that being aware that the world is inherently unfair and, and seeking justice for people who have been disadvantaged or oppressed is is a weakness and um, and it also takes away rights from the from folks who are part of the dominant group so white cisgender heterosexual etc uh, human rights aren't a pie uh, when you take it's there aren't limited slices we can all have rights sometimes it is about acknowledging privilege and taking a step back from that and acknowledging that you got where you are maybe not because just because of the color of your skin but you didn't have to fight as hard to get there because of the color of your skin. Um, the desire to remove EDI initiatives from post-secondary is the idea that um, encouraging empathy and understanding and justice and, and anti-oppression limit academic thought and limit discourse and, and create this atmosphere where you have to agree on everything or you're going to be canceled. Um, what it is, I think, EDI, because I work in the EDI department in, in some ways, it, it's about accountability it's about acknowledging that we can absolutely have differing opinions, but when it comes to our each individual identities and our own experiences, we get to be the experts of those. And we, don't, uh, we can't be told that our experiences aren't what we believe them to be. 
Um, we can have them maybe challenged in certain ways, but um, the idea is that we all are accountable for the things that come out of our mouths and the things that we type on the internet. And you, if you are spewing something or, or professing something that is hate speech, that is causing harm or invalidating someone, and especially if it's not rooted in data and understanding um, coming from research, uh, then that's not academic freedom, that's just hate speech. Um, and we need to be able to draw that line. But unfortunately, that line has become very blurred. Uh, and instead of engaging in a very real discussion of what is academic freedom and what does it mean to show up and take accountability for what the words that come out of your mouth, um, we've just decided to ban those uncomfortable conversations because people don't want to be uncomfortable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, and all of your, I know you all have multiple worlds as well, in a world that Katie lives in. She's also in queerconsultingyql.com. So if you would like to take any of her ex... .ca, just kidding, .ca. Um, if you would like to take any, um, if you have any further questions, please get a hold of her that way. And before everyone goes on to the rest of their beautiful, snowy, Lethbridge spring day, if you could give us a short kind of takeaway as we kind of... Me? Yeah, short. Short? Oh, yes, thank you for emphasizing. <laughs> takeaway. Um, my short takeaway is approach the world with empathy. Look to understand from a perspective that is not your own and listen to people uh, when they speak about their lived experience. Uh, and when something doesn't seem right, it's maybe worth looking into. Uh, so don't be afraid to be loud, lift your voice, but also take time to listen and take time to understand.